Hey, and welcome to the State of Tech podcast, recorded November 19th, 2011, episode 5, Creative Tech Support. I'm Sean Beavers, and as always, I'm joined by Eric. And Eric, guys, how are you doing this weekend? Hey, I'm doing just fine. Thanks for asking. Um, just got uh, back from the fire department. Uh, no, no fires. Nothing's nothing burned down. Uh, we had our uh, Cub Scout uh, field trip to the fire department today, and it went really well. So, just a big thank you to um, our local fire department and fire guys everywhere. Thank you for all you do. And uh, with the um, time change we just had recently, just a good reminder that it's a good time to change your batteries and your smoke detectors. They were mentioning that today while we're there. So pass that on to everybody else so having a great day here Eric G how you doing very good very good I am uh, I'm work I'm at work today so that's why I have my awesome monitor set up behind me and uh, nothing about firemen so you know not not very interesting there but uh, just you know catching up reading some blog posts about uh, dots and in, in uh, clothing so yeah looking forward to finishing that that blog post and uh, yeah nothing new all right, great, and we are joined by two returning guests. This is, uh, I, uh, you know, the first episode where I can actually say that. Uh, T.J. Houston and Brian Poole. How are you guys doing? Uh, another day in paradise here. Getting ready for uh, Thanksgiving, as you can tell. Uh, just living the dream, if you will. That hat is spectacular. For for those for those that are not getting the benefit of the video podcast, T.J. has a turkey on his head. Let's just leave it at that. His head is inside a turkey. So, and I'm rocking out the better, Google shape. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, I think we better make the distinction that it is not a real turkey that he's wearing on his head. I think it's more fun if you just leave that up to the <laughs> listener's imagination. True. And uh, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Brian does not have a mashed potato hat, so if, if those of you are wondering who are listening, that is, that is absent. So... All right, and if this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, uh, this is the State of Tech podcast where we share our uh, technology news, our awesome thing of the week, and best practices in and around the state of Ohio. And speaking of Ohio, uh, Eric and Eric, I'll turn it over to you and fill everybody in on the news. Great. I'll start it off. First, I'd like to remind you guys that uh, eTech is approaching, and uh, we have until to Ze- uh, I'm sorry, December 1st to... Uh, to do early registration there, early bird registration. Uh, you actually save about 20% by doing that. So uh, it's the 14th annual conference there. It's on uh, February, maybe it's, uh, yeah, February 13th through the 15th at the Greater Columbus Convention Center. And uh, in our show notes, we'll have a link. And uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk about what we'll be doing there at the, uh, at the show. Sure, we'll be doing a live podcast in one of the rooms. We're not sure where that is going to be. It could be underneath the elevator. I don't know. But uh, some room in the convention center will be doing a live podcast on Wednesday, I believe, and just talking about some of the great stuff that we saw at eTech. And we would love for any of you who are listening to the podcast uh, to join us and share some of the stuff that you saw as well. Yep. All right. Um, I'll also mention that some of us, I don't know if other folks are presenting there, Um, I will be presenting twice as well, Uh, get an opportunity to talk about rolling out Google Apps for Education. So if you're a district that is looking into Google Apps and you're curious about uh, what's all involved in that rollout process, or even if you're just early on in it, we'll be sharing what we as a district at North Canton did for our rollout process. And then I'll be doing another session on using Google Forms and how you can use it for just about everything in your district. Um, Other guys? You guys sharing something there as well? Well, we're doing, uh, we're going to do some sessions. Soita is going to do some sessions on Google. So I'm doing one on Chrome in the classroom. And we're going to have a room, I think, on the first floor. And the cool thing about it is it's going to be all Chromebooks. So Google is, I think, not donating, but they're lending some Chromebooks. Uh, so that should be pretty sweet. Well, excellent. Um, the other piece of news, we really don't have a whole lot of news this week, but is e-tech related as well. And that is that they're just about ready to uh, release their technology planning tool. Um, if you're a tech coordinator, this means something to you. If not, you can go make a quick sandwich. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea is every three years, districts have to uh, create a new uh, tech plan that lasts for three years and kind of 
charts out what you're going to be doing over that time. And uh, we, we use a service that eTech provides to create that tech plan. And from what I understand, they've worked really, really hard to improve it this time around. They're always adding new things. I guess the big change this time around is pre-population. So they're trying to have as much stuff already loaded in for you as possible just to make you know your job easier. So December 1st is when I believe the new tool is supposed to be available, so if you check it out right now, I think I'm probably looking at the old version right now, but December 1st, the new one will be coming out, so a big thanks to the folks at eTech for helping us out with that, and just a reminder to be uh, putting together your committees to start working on that if your tech plan is coming up on its third year and needing to be renewed. So uh, that's the news. I'm going to throw this back to Sean, unless there's anything else anybody has to share. Pretty slim pickings uh, this week. All right, so the next uh, thing we're going to talk about is our awesome thing of the week. And in this segment, we talk about one thing that we found. It could be a website. It could be an app. It could be, um, you know, an, a program on a computer. And I'm going to be talking about uh, Kindertown, which is an iOS app. And this app is a specific app store for uh, pre-K through first grade. And so um, for those of you who are listening to podcasts and not watching it, um, I'm going to pull up that window here in a minute. Uh, there we go. And I just came across this uh, last week, and it's great. You can specify what age the child is, so it's you can check uh, from three to six, paid or free apps, what curriculum area, language arts, math, or social studies, and uh, it will pull up apps again only for pre-K through first grade, and that app is free. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric C. for his awesome thing of the week. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share for my uh, awesome thing of the week a website called Free Technology for Teachers. And uh, this is a website put out by Richard Byrne. And it's a blog. And what he does on this website is several times a day usually share some really useful uh, education tool. And um, the thing that's nice about a site like this is many times you know you're wondering where can I find you know good resources for math for science for social studies for language arts and so forth and um, Richard does does a great job of finding these things and sharing them on his blog the blog is free tech the number four teachers.com now mentioning that in itself is pretty awesome just go to the site you can find all that but I want to go one step further with uh, what my recommendation is for how to use a site like like this. Um, we're all very busy and you know we don't have a lot of time and so you'll forget hey I haven't checked free tech for teachers in a long time I wonder if something's new. So instead of doing that I, I will always recommend people to use the RSS feed when you find a site like this and to subscribe to the site and then put that in like Google Reader for example. So I can see here on, on Richard's site free techforteachers.com. He's got an RSS button up here in the top right hand corner that if I go in and select that link I can take that and I can put it into a service like Google Reader. Now there's lots of different RSS readers but Google Reader is one that works really well and I can come in here and I can click the subscribe button and I could paste in that link to his RSS feed and at that point I would then be subscribed to his site in my Google Reader. So my Google Reader kind of looks like this. If you take a look you'll see that I have Google subscriptions where I have all kinds of blog posts from from Google, but then below there I've got tech integration uh, sites like Free Tech for Teachers, which is the one we just mentioned, as well as many others you can see here on my screen. And then whenever I come to Google Reader, I can check out all the latest stuff at once. I don't have to visit this site and that site and this site and that site. I go to one place, Google Reader, and I can just scroll down through and see all of these really awesome resources that have been in there. And that way I can catch up real fast on anything I've missed all in one place. Um, for a quick example, uh, one of the things he had on here recently I was a math teacher in a previous life and so uh, prior to doing stuff so here was one he was talking about uh, math open reference uh, which was a website that has free online reference for geometry teachers and students it's got interactive animated drawings well you've sold me right there as soon as you start talking about something being interactive and animated in math I'm all about that so I could simply click on that link to go to his original blog post read a little bit more about it and of course then I could follow the link that he has in there to the website 
and at that point I've got all these great math tools maybe jump into the 3D section maybe take a look at surface area that's something kids struggle with a lot gives me this great interactive here where I see a cube and I can adjust the length of any side and it automatically updates the surface area for me I can even click this button that says explode to separate all the sides out so the kids can see each of the faces there so those are the kind of really neat resources that you're going to find on a site like that on the free tech for teachers site while you're there please note he does a really good job also of tagging his posts so at the bottom of any post he has labels there like math or technology or Google Maps or something and you can find other posts he's put on that deal with that same topic so just a great website again that's free tech the number four teachers dot com and I'll go ahead and throw this over to Eric G thank you much yeah, I uh, my free or oh, I'm sorry, awesome thing of the week is free, and it's actually built into Windows 7. Uh, not able to demonstrate this now, but I have a link in the show notes uh, that links to a YouTube document. And what it is is the Windows 7 snipping tool. Um, now I've used this, uh, I've used tools like this, you know, Jing and Camtasia, and you know, there's a dozen or so screen grabbing tools. You can also just hit print screen or I forget what the command is on a Mac. It's been a while, but I'm sure our two Mac fans in the audience will. Command Shift 4. Exactly. See, that was the tip, tip of the tongue, tip of the tongue. Anyway, uh, print screen, or actually if you hit Alt in print screen, it, it selects the active window uh, in Windows and, and takes a capture of that, and then just copies it to the clipboard. Well, the tool that I'm talking about is called the Snipping Tool for Windows. It actually is the applic an application that you run, and it sort of whites out the screen gives you a little um, box that you can draw around, whatever you want to capture, and then that too either allows you to save it as a JPEG, a GIF, a, um, you know, any type of image format, as well as copy it to the screen. It also allows you to write on the document with your, or uh, the, the capture with your mouse. So how I use it is I've instructed my teachers that, hey, when you get an error, instead of picking up the phone and calling me and saying, what does command code error 49 blah 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 mean? Take a screen capture of that, copy, and then paste it into your Google uh, Google Apps or Gmail, because that's what we use here, and then just paste it to me, and I get to see that exact error message. Um, now, there is one little thing that you need to turn on, and it's a lab in Google. It's called uh, Inserting Images, and it's by someone named Kent T. And as soon as you add that lab, it allows you to just copy and paste images right into Gmail, something you should have turned on anyway if you don't, because it's a great, great lab. So that's how I use uh, that tool, and that's my awesome thing of the week. So thank you. TJ, you want to share? Sure. Uh, this week I'm in actually some online classes through BG, and they're all solely online, so I had to get together with different people from different time zones. Um, and I actually found a pretty cool utility, um, seeing as how everybody wasn't using the Google Calendar, so you couldn't use Find a Time. Um, and it's actually called Doodle, um, doodle.com. And what you do is you actually come in here, and you're able to pick your um, like different times that you can get together. And then you can see here, these are the three um, people that are in my group. So I created these uh, time zone, or these time, thing. when are you free? You know, And they can come in here and check the boxes. So I can see that everybody was free at November, you know, on November 15th at 8.30 everybody's good to go, that's the best time to have a meeting. You know, here, and it's, I mean, it's very visual to see, you know, and this is only with three people, but um, our ITC, NOECA, uses it as well um, to find out when everybody's open, because uh, everybody doesn't use the Google, so they can't, you know, they don't know what the Google calendars are on the find the time, and it's also free, uh, so it's definitely worth taking a look at. All right, great. Well, we'll, we'll jump right into our main topic uh, this week, which is creative tech support, and we've divided that uh, into two sections. We're going to start off talking about having non-traditional people helping, so like students, parents, and volunteers, and then talk about ways that you can be your own tech support and some of the websites that you can use. So, uh, TJ, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the ways that you've been using non-traditional people? Sure. Um, first off, I'm uh, in Huron, Ohio, uh, Huron City Schools, um, and as far as a um, ET or IT department. Um, I'm really the only just technology person. Um, under me, I have uh, one librarian um, who's great. Um, she knows a lot of technology stuff. Um, and under that, I have building techs, which are also librarians. 
um, or they're called media specialists, um, who were librarians, again, in a previous life, and they've been tasked with first response. Um, I've actually found as far as non-traditional um, and having other people help, you really need a first responder there in order just to, you know, that can follow directions or someone, you know, that can just help that teacher right then and there because if you're covering, you know, four, five, 15 different buildings, you can't always be there. But, you know, if you have someone who is, and I'm sure you do, um, who is at least just, you know, can follow directions or know enough to keep it going, unplug the smart board, plug it back in, those basic uh, you know, troubleshoot, troubleshooting steps, it's really great. And in my previous district, Firelands, we had the um, ability to have a um, student helper. So we had an NCT, a network communication technology class through our GVS that was hosted at our school. So we had, you know, they were learning about technology and break it, fix it things. So that was just a natural fit for them to be able to fix things in that building. Um, and I maybe had to go there, you know, once a week or, you know, and I'd go over there and show them something cool new and they would be able to help me out even more. And I think education and teaching somebody how to do something just makes your job that much easier. Um, if you, you know, teach a man to fish, and he'll fish, fish forever. But if you feed a fish a man, he can eat for a while. Anyway. So teaching that person how to help you is really going to work out to your benefit. Um, so that's what, you know, we do over here on. Back to you. All right, Brian, you want to talk a little about what you do at National Trail? Yeah, uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Um, my name's Nat, uh, Brian Poole, and I am, again, just like TJ was, single point for um, our technology support. I teach half-time, and I'm the tech coordinator the other half of the time, basically on, um, we're on a block schedule, so on brown days, I teach a full schedule for that day, and then on orange days, I'm free. We have about 750 PCs and about 1,100 students in the district. And when I say PCs, 550 are permanent placements, and another 200 are uh, netbooks, laptops, uh, cart systems. And um, the classes that I teach are all hardware-related. I teach two A-plus um, hardware classes to students. Um, it's a second-level computer class for them. And then the students that do well at that class apply to join my tech class, um, which they can take for up to two years, for two years' worth of credit. Um, they're junior and senior, or just senior year, depending on when they start, and that is my, really, tech team. Uh, other than that, I do have three teachers that have access to our online help system that um, can help, but they're strictly voluntary, and um, they do help offset some things for me, though. All right, so let's take a look at student helpers. And uh, Eric C., do you want to share some of the feedback we got on our survey first, and then we'll kind of go through and, and see, you know, if anybody's had success with student helpers in their respective districts? All right, yeah, thanks. A uh, little bit different this week. We did get a lot of great feedback on our survey that we put out prior to uh, the episode. Uh, just as a reminder to folks, about a month before each episode, we try to announce what the topic is going to be and then go ahead and put a, a survey out there where people can provide feedback and give us some ideas about what they're doing. And that really is, again, the whole point of the show. We really want to highlight what you know, awesome things folks are doing around the state of Ohio. So we did throw that out there and said, hey, what are you doing, Ohio schools, with uh, tech support and schools around Ohio? What, what are you doing? Got a lot of really good stuff back. So I'm just going to quickly uh, touch on a few of those. And uh, yeah, let's start with um, student um, tech support. And um, then we can chat about that. And then we'll pop on to some of the other ones as well. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is from Milford uh, City, or excuse me, Milford Exempted Village School District. District, and uh, got a chance to get some feedback from uh, Mark Hopkins there, who's the tech director. And what he says they do is they uh, typically get about four to six students um, that they bring in during the summertime and then many times use them as well throughout the school year. And um, what they do is they select those students from a pool that has been recommended by one of their teachers. They've got an applied technology teacher. And Mark really thought that was essential. That was one of the critical things that made this a success for them was they already had existing relationships with these kids. They're kids who had been in a class, a teacher could vouch for them and so forth. Um, then 
the next step in that process, Mark said, was that they have two technicians on staff who really work with those students quite a lot. They manage their students' schedules, uh, what assignments they're going to be given, and they, they, they directly supervise them. On top of that, Mark himself meets with them weekly to plan out what the goals are for that week. Uh, so you can tell there's a lot, of, a lot of energy is put into that to make sure it's organized properly. Uh, what he said is that it has saved him a lot of money. He estimated about $20,000 in contracted labor. Uh, the sort of things the kids are doing ends up being more of level one kind of stuff, some, some lower end things. But again, when you think about that, if all of that stuff is being done by those students, then that is freeing up time for uh, Mark and the rest of his tech staff to be doing things on a level two or a level three sort of, uh, of problem. Uh, the other person that we heard from was Kurt Dennis from Jefferson Local Schools. And... Um, what he said is that they do typically hire about one uh, high school student during the summer, and then they try to, again, keep that person on through the school year. Um, and it's a pretty involved process as well. There's an application process. They have an interview. A lot of energy, again, put into making sure that the, you know, the right student is chosen for the position. Um, a lot of similar things being done there. The student ends up doing things like cleaning projector filters and cleaning out PCs, which that really is critical. Those are the kind of things that you think about it, they fall through the cracks because we're so busy trying to do so many other things, then you end up replacing a projector that overheated because it didn't get cleaned out in three years. You know, Well, he's got students doing that sort of thing at seven fifty an hour, and it gives them a lot of practice for later in life. Um, they've heard a lot of good things from those kids, and it also shows them being fiscally responsible with their money to to their community. Uh, the last thing that Kurt had to share about that was that he finds it's really important to have a good solid checklist for the students because sometimes they forget what step they're on if they have to start something one day and pick it up the next or they skip a step. So he keeps them busy and gives them very, very specific instructions about what to do. So there's a little bit of information about students using students to help out with tech support. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Pros, cons, what's worked for you guys? I, uh, I've, I know Brian has uh, some things to say about this, but I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I've, uh, the first year I tested this at, this is the first year that I've tested this at Mechanicsburg, and over the summer I had about five student helpers, and uh, it was nice. I mean, uh, to start with, uh, there was an additional need to, to supervise there, but um, the, you know, a lot of great things that the, the students did. I was able to, like you said, uh, or like Dennis, uh, uh, Kurt Dennis said that, you know, clean projector filters. We, we hung a Meraki network, had to mention Meraki. Um, uh, we did a lot of great things, you know, cleaned out 450 PCs. But anything else, I mean, management-wise, uh, I, I would agree with Kurt. I mean, you have to, to you know, manage and help and, and show them and, and really work with them in, in how to do this, uh, some of the skills uh, that you're providing. So, One thing, too, I wanted to just ask a question. Um, I'm currently at a district, you know, unlike my previous one, um, it doesn't have a, say, hardware specific class. Uh, we have a lot of digital photography, Photoshop, um, Final Cut Pro, things like that, but we don't have a hardware class. So do you think it's necessary to maybe have that teacher that teaches that class? Uh, like Brian, you know, you, you teach that class, so you, you're like the responder. Like, do you feel a need for that? Because I'm looking at my photography and my art teachers, and, you know, I don't see them as being strong hardware-wise, maybe to do the brake fix, or does it not matter? Uh, I, you know, I, I guess mine's different because I'm teaching the classes. I would have a hard time, personally, uh, having students break into PCs that I didn't know were trained to do what I was asking them to do. Just to hope that, I mean, because there's lots of good kids that, you know, I, they've built a PC before and they think they know how to do stuff, that when it comes down to it, you know, they don't know what the oil can sound means in a hard drive. They don't know. I mean, there's a lot of things that... I save broken stuff so they see what it, okay, this is what it sounds like. You hear this, you don't need to test it, it's a bad hard drive. And, and so I, you know, I work through um, each section of our A-plus book in the hardware class, and when we're in that section, you know, when we're, we're in the memory section, they run around, and I have them test with the Ultimate Boot CD every single PC in the entire district, the memory, during that, and no, so I have... 
18 kids in hardware. I have 10 in one class and 8 in the other, and I'll divide them up into elementary, high school, and middle school, and that's what they'll do for, for three or four class periods. Now, when they're done, I have no question about when they're in my tech class, do I need to tell them how to test memory? Absolutely not. Every single one of them knows how to pull it in, pull it out, put it in, and they know how to test it. And when I'm in the hardware section, they go around with the Ultimate Boot CD, and they do a short test of every single hard drive in the disk district. So, I mean, it's really, it works out to really well as a uh, preventive maintenance thing with, with the hardware class. They don't do as much fixing out in the field as they do, can you not hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just saw no sound. Um, but in the hardware class doesn't do as much out in the field, really, uh, fixing stuff as they do testing. And they're kind of my preventive maintenance. They do all the PC setups so that in the fall when we're going over introduction to PCs and all the hookups and everything. Um, and so by the time they're done with that class, the only thing I usually teach them in when they get to my tech class is, you know, how do you actually image? They already know how to replace hard drives. They know how to test hard drives. They just may not know how to image a PC. And, you know, we use two different imaging solutions. We use both a FOG server, which is an open source uh, system, and we use uh, uh, Ghost as well because depending on which one Ghost doesn't work as well with some machines and is really pathetically slow, whereas Fog works great with Windows 7 and some of the newer things like and Linux distributions. But So anyway, so I mean, I'm, I feel like I know which kids can do what before they get to my tech class and I know, okay, I know that that student, I won't mention names because they can watch this, I know that student shouldn't be sent out by themselves to go do a hard drive, but I can pair them with this student and say, hey, make sure he or she knows how to do that by the, you know, and, and let them do it and watch them for me. And, and that's one of the reasons they can do it for two years. And in fact, my Tech 4 students, when they're looking for an aid slot that's not a credit, I have two Tech 4 students in my class on, on Orange Days that they don't get any credit for it. They just come in my room and I'm like, okay, this is what's on the, on the uh, ticket for the, today. Go out and do that. And if they can't, they come back and say, hey, we, we didn't know how to fix it. And we move from there. So. I'll uh, jump in with a, a little bit from uh, North Canton. Um, we have used student helpers as well over um, the last several years. Um, and if it's helpful, you guys did a great job kind of setting up what sort of things you, you support. I'll, I'll throw that out to North Canton. would be about seven buildings, uh, 600 staff members, about 5,000 students, probably 1,800 or so computers, somewhere in that range. And we have uh, six people on our tech staff um, in various, you know, uh, buildings and, and areas. Um, but, you know, you know, to have the, the, the help of the students, you know, really, really has been very valuable. Um, as far as the good and the bad of it, it, it really does depend on, you know, making sure that you are supervising them, that you are giving them good training, and that you're staying, you know, up on what's happening. Uh, just like Brian said, I will mention no names. The guilty will stay anonymous in all of this. Uh, but yeah, we've had, we've had, you know, students who have just done amazing jobs where, you know, you taught them how to do something. They're out imaging computers. They're out doing all sorts of wonderful things. And then we've had, you know, um, an experience where um, a student was to, uh, blow out the dust from the computers, which is a very important thing. And the best guess I have is that they really liked the sound that the processor fan made when you blew the, uh, the, uh, the compressed air on it and uh, did that a little too much and uh, broke some of the little fan blades off of the processor fans. Um, and so the school year starts. We don't know this had happened. And so everybody starts booting up their labs, and it sounds like some of the computers are, are grinding coffee. I mean, they're just shaking and rattling and all that, and we pop them open, and sure enough, there's fan blades missing. And once those things start spinning, they just go crazy. And so, yeah, we ended up replacing and spending money and fixing things that we never should have had to do. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a lesson learned about making sure that we are, um, you know, staying involved with that student and giving them the, the, the guidance they need. The other thing I'll throw out real quick is that we're hearing a lot of high-level stuff. We're talking about imaging. We're talking about high school kids. This doesn't just have to be high school kids. Um, our middle school this year is doing some stuff with student helpers. One of our, um, one of our teachers there who's doing a little bit of uh, tech work on the side 
decided to take eighth grade students and use them during the last period of the day, which is like a study hall period. And those students um, are helping out with our mobile lab. We have two mobile carts there in the building. And those carts need to get from room, one room to another for that next day. And instead of people worrying about, you know, is the cart in good condition? Has it been charged? Has it been moved? The students are taking care of that. And so, um, you know, eighth grade kids. And, you know, again, you're, you're trying to take advantage of folks who, you know, kids who might really have nothing else to do. It's a study hall. Maybe they've got everything done. And so, again, though, the key is you've got to have somebody who is taking the responsibility for it to say, I will be the person to watch over this. I will help these kids. I will train them. I will put that time into it. Without that kind of a person, um, you're probably asking for trouble unless you're just really fortunate and just found, you know, a, a really awesome kid for that. But a little bit of information there anyway. What about teachers? How has that worked out for everybody? And you know, obviously, I can't speak to that in, in my position, but the four of you can as, as tech coordinators. You know, yeah, um, I'll I'll throw in real quick on the teachers from our survey. We'll we'll, we'll kick it off with what we heard from the survey. Um, we did have quite a few responses on that as well, but the one that um, I'll go ahead and share was a gentleman named Jeff Ludwig. And he is from Northwest Local Schools in Canal Fulton. Now, that's just right up the road from me, so I actually know Jeff personally. Um, and he has a, a teacher uh, helper program. And basically, the way it works is at each of his buildings, they have um, building techs that are regular teachers who have full course loads. They're teaching all day. They're not getting a release period. It's nothing like that. They're teaching math or science or social studies or whatever all day long. But they're also identified as a building tech. What they get for this is a stipend. And so in their district, is kind of like a coach level stipend for that. Um, and basically, those people are that first line of defense. If there's a problem, if there's something that somebody needs help with, they know they can, you know, put in a help ticket and then these people are going to see it or they can run by their room or they can stop by real quick and check with them. And they're going to be that, you know, that first set of eyes. In many things, they can go ahead and help them and say, oh, you just need to plug that in a different way or whatever the case is. If not, they'll elevate that up to the tech director, up, up to Jeff, but at least he knows it's gone through something. It's, it, it's gone through one, one layer, one filter before the tech requests get to him. Uh, his his advice on that was to give lots of training at the beginning. And I mean, I think this is going to be true whether it's students, teachers, parents, interns. We're hearing the same thing again and again from people who wrote in on the survey. Give them lots of training at the beginning. And then Jeff said he writes up very detailed help guides. Sounds a lot like the checklist that we heard earlier with the students, but very detailed help guides step by step on what to do so those teachers you know, are comfortable with that. Now he says over time, after a few years, if somebody's been in this position for a while, they really become very independent and can take care of this very much on their own, but he does spend a lot of time up front getting that going. I know that at North Canton we did have a program kind of like that a few years ago. We called it the TILT program. It was the Tech Integration Lead Teacher program. Yeah, it focused more on tech integration, uh, so it wasn't fixing necessarily hardware issues, but it was well, I mean, how, how many of our questions are hardware and how many are software? A lot of times they're software. How do I do this in a program? I'm having trouble, you know, getting my Gmail to do this or that, or how do I make this work in docs? And so these people were there to focus more on using the equipment. And unfortunately, with, with, with budget cuts, we are no longer able to do that. I would love to be able to bring back a program like that as well. But it functioned very much like Jeff's. Uh, the only difference being I did meet with them once a month to make sure everybody was on the same base before we went out for the next month and, you know, but uh, yeah, so that's some information on teachers helping out with tech support. Others? As a side note, um, you know, if you are a Google Docs district, um, it's very easy to share out, say, a folder um, that can be tutorials or help. And then whenever you add things to that, it automatically goes there. So it almost takes a step out of the teacher going to the website. You know, it's already in their Google. We already have our teachers going to Gmail. So if they just click Doc, I mean, it simplifies it for them instead of, hey, go find it on the website, you know. I did, a, or here's the link to it directly. That way, they can kind of browse there first and see if you've written up something before you, you know, before they submit a help desk ticket or check out the FAQs. All right, I'll chime in with how I'm using teachers. Um, basically, I have, uh, I really have a core team of teachers that answer those questions, like Eric just talked about it, which are application questions. Uh, because we do a tech in service every March. 
which mirrors the SORTA conference and the ETEC conference, I have uh, probably 15 teachers that everyone knows, hey, if I've got a smart word question, these are the teachers I can go to. If I've got a Moodle question, here's the teachers I can go to. So on the application side, it, it I, I don't really do anything. They just know who is proficient in that application. When it comes to fixing stuff, um, I use a um, website or a, a web server called um, called Spiceworks. And um, if you don't know what Spiceworks is, it's a way for you to run a help desk off of any PC um, really easily. And the, the users basically see, um, oh, I can't just bring it up while I'm logged in here, I guess. Um, they see, it, they don't even have to log in. It, it connects with Active Directory to put in help requests. But then on um, the other side of it, I have my, I have a login. My tech students have a login so they can see what help test tickets have been put in. And then I have three other teachers, one in the middle, or two in the middle school and one in the elementary school that have logons. So they can just go in and look at what the tickets are. And if they see one that they are, feel like they can do, I, I've told them, you know, if it's something you, you were comfortable with, go ahead and do it. All I ask them to do is that if they go in there, they have to put in um, what they did in the, in the ticket checklist down here before they close it. So they would put in, you know, I went in, uh, the only problem was that she needed a new monitor cable, I put one in for her and they closed the ticket. So I do have teachers that um, help with that stuff and a lot of time it's things that I, I've showed them before and sometimes they come down and say, uh, hey, they've got a problem with their TV card, they can't get the, the, the TV to show through it through their LCD projector. Can you show me how to get that fixed? Um, the downside, I would say, on on my teacher helpers is that I've never really had time set aside to do what I should do, which is to um, like like Eric just talked about front load training with them. I spend a lot of time training students. I don't spend the same amount of time tech wise uh, as far as tech support stuff training um, my teachers, which would be really helpful if I did. I just have a general question to all those who who do use teachers like that, and um, I I have teachers, you know, just like Brian, who we have uh, a couple of Google certified teachers are on their way to getting Google certified teachers. Um, but uh, my question is is what happens? Um, and and this I've I've definitely experienced this is what happens if that teacher uh, or if another teacher says. Oh, I'm not even going to pay attention. I, I don't need to worry about it because I've got so and so right down the hall who's going to help me out anyway, who I know I can go to support. You know, my fear is that that, that teacher who needs that extra care and support won't get any better because he or she is, you know, relying too heavily on that, that teacher who has all that experience. So has anybody ever experienced anything like that? Yeah, I think that is true, and that, that is something that we have to be uh, careful of. We want to provide as much tech support as possible, but part of good tech support is not just supporting people, but training them, helping them to become better at technology themselves. And you're right, it is a unique situation that if you have somebody in a building that is permanently there, um, that it, it is, yes, it is possible people could say, um, I don't really need to learn this myself, so-and-so is going to take care of it. Um, and so you're right, I, I think um, part of that is um, setting healthy boundaries and making very clear, you know, what you need to do to, you know, get help and to submit help tickets. But also, if it is like a teacher who's doing that help and they're a full load teacher, real good chance they're not going to be able to just at the drop of a hat be there and help folks. And so, you know, that maybe is a, a plus in the column for using a traditional teacher as a first line of defense because it will require the folks asking for help to do a little bit more on their own, I would imagine, since that teacher is in the middle of a class. But it's a, it's, it's a good concern. How about parents? Anybody use parents to help out? Well, that, that's another one of those ones I think kind of scares people a little bit. We did hear from one school 
about that and uh, that one was actually um, in Kentucky so hey thanks to a non-Ohio school for getting involved here it was uh, Bishop uh, Brosart High School and um, the the tech coordinator there was was sharing how at a previous school that she had worked in um, which was which was an elementary school um, that they did use parent helpers for tech support and um, I thought that was interesting that they mentioned that it was at an elementary school and I, I think that does make a lot of sense because we've seen that in our district that as students get older the parent involvement drops down and so what you see in the PTO involvement in the elementary becomes a little less in the middle school parents group and is almost non-existent by the time you get to the high school and that makes sense um, and so the elementary I think if you're gonna look at using parents to provide tech support that does sound like a really good level to try it out at, at the elementary now uh, the tech coordinator there did mention that the key was being very specific with the responsibilities saying okay parents we have something set aside for you to do here you know this is what it is so it might be helping out in the labs being another set of hands when the students are working on something things like that so um, we have not we have not used that ourselves but I was glad to hear at least from somebody in our survey that they had success at the elementary level has anybody else done anything with parents I don't think so. Yeah, I'm not, not. I'm not hearing a whole lot on that. But I think that's a, an area that, again, if done properly, uh, we really could take advantage of some, you know, really skilled folks who'd be glad to help out. Um, all right, uh, Sean, you want me to pop into the last one then on interns, and we'll wrap up this section with that. Sure. Sure. Um, and for those that again that are listening, we're going to kind of divide this half and half. We're going to switch gears here in a second and move away from people providing help to more of helping yourself, being able to provide your own tech support. Um, and so the last category we were concerned or curious about was interns. Uh, by interns, I think my definition would be more along the lines of a, a college student or a technical school student who as part of their requirement for the coursework they're taking needs to do so many hours. Um, I did hear from Matt Simpson. I wasn't able to uh, pull up his website here, so I apologize for that. But uh, it's Matt Simpson from Meigs Local down in Pomeroy, Ohio. Got to talk with Matt on the phone really nice guy appreciated him taking the time to share this with us um, he says that they do use interns from Washington State Community College and very successfully um, it's gonna sound like a broken record here but he says a lot of it again depends upon the person you choose and so he spends a lot of time making sure he properly interviews those people and then uh, after that you know makes a good selection you know based on that um, I'm very curious about taking advantage of something like this in North Canton we're very fortunate to be in a very college university uh, rich environment here I mean we've got Malone and Walsh and Akron and Kent and we've got Brown Mackey Community College and Stark Tech Community Stark Tech College uh, we've got all of these different things around here and many of them do offer intern programs and so uh, I'm definitely I can't speak to it now but I'm definitely going to be pursuing this I know that one time we have had a college student work with us it was not an official intern program but he wanted to get skills to help him in college and it was one of the best experiences experiences we ever had just did a phenomenal job these are kids you know young adults who you know are gonna be a little bit more mature and um, really have a, a purpose and a reason to be learning this and you're gonna only have them for a while okay it's not gonna be somebody that you're gonna be you know keeping from year to year but it's somebody that you can definitely have um, you know for uh, oh you know it's a, a few months typically is what they'll have to complete you know so many hours for their course again gotta have somebody for them to shadow you need somebody for them to stick with during that time anybody else on interns uh, yeah uh, I, would, I wouldn't mind go ahead you're good oh no uh, well I internships is, is something that that is near and dear in my heart because I actually started at Vandalia Butler City Schools as an internship and and uh, you know to me I wanted to give back um, or I guess pay it forward would be a, a different way to say it. Um, so when I actually did become a tech at, at Vandalia and started to work there, you know, we did the same process. We hired uh, interns from other school districts, uh, I'm sorry, from other colleges, and um, it worked out well. Um, only had to fire one uh, for just, uh, you know, random un unsupervising or I guess bad supervision reasons but um, it, it was a good experience um, some internships were uh, were paid and some were not 
Um, I recently looked at Bowling Green U University's plan, and, and they encourage paying students now. You didn't have to be paid when, when I was an intern there. So um, it, it, was an, it was a nice thing, and uh, everybody is absolutely right. It, it really depends on supervision, and it really helps to be, you know, pick someone who is already involved in that topic. Um, when I started as an internship, I, or when I started my internship, it was a graphic design internship and I ended up helping out teachers and, and everything else and because I had that that technical skill set I, I jumped into doing troubleshooting and everything else so uh, it, it was a nice um, nice uh, nice way to start out my my career in technology for me but sorry did you have something right. yeah well, so uh, similar to uh, what you had said um, I also started as an intern right out of um, my high school and I actually worked at my high school like the semester after um, just because I knew you know what I had gone through and I know that there was only one person and I just wanted to help out um, at that time it wasn't necessarily to get the experience um, but it ended up a great place for me to go and learn about things and then it looked awesome on a resume it was an unpaid internship I went there you know once twice a week um, whenever I could um, and I just started to you know see how schools ran and I fell in love with it. Um, so I definitely encourage um, anybody out there who, you know, it's a great place to start with IT. Um, I love my job. I love every minute, even when I'm here till 1, 2, or on the weekends. Um, but it's a great time to start, and it's a great place to start. Um, great hours, great people. Um, but I also just talked to one of my friends who was like, I can't, you know, I don't have any experience, blah, blah, blah. And I encouraged him, you know, come to Huron. You know, you can, you know, we can work it out so you, you can get an internship here and at least build that resume. Um, the only negative really that I see, um, what kind of happened um, at my high school, um, and it might have been totally unrelated, um, there was two tech people uh, at the school and you know here's this young whippersnapper coming in there you know for free and you know we're not paying him, he's doing more work than the guy that we're paying X amount of dollars to let's just get rid of the guy who, you know, is paying money. So it kind of put me in an awkward position um, because that did happen. Um, but that's the only, I guess, negative that I would see is you have a young gun in here. You know, if he's outperforming the person who maybe has a life, has kids, who can't dedicate maybe, you know, I mean, I'm over the top. You know, that's just how I am. So I unfortunately might, may have caused that person, you know, to have to look elsewhere for a job or, you know, well, again, might have been totally unrelated, but it was just kind of threw up a flag at that time, like, oh, you know, I just kind of affected somebody here. So that's the only negative, I guess, I would see. Well, um, I'd like to chime in, I guess. I started out as an intern for Dayton Power and Light, which is how I ended up getting my uh, job when I started a programmer as uh, for NCR. And I did the same thing for some of my students. I've had a couple students that went on to be programmers at Miami, and um, so when they were looking for summer internships, you know, we were only paying uh, this one particular student um, ten dollars an hour, and she had finished her junior year. And I had her doing PHP programming um, when we redesigned our whole Moodle site and programmed it ourselves, and it worked out uh, uh, fantastic. And it worked out fantastic for both of us because she said that was one of the biggest things when she did her interviews after graduating that uh, she, she ended up getting a really nice job up in the Cleveland area for Macy's as a programmer up there. Um, and that internship did, you know, tons for for them. So I think it's a win-win. And, I, you know, we have an ITT tech over in Richmond, and um, I l have not looked at doing that, but I'm sure we can find students uh, – as opposed to what you had, I, I have no no potential at this point of getting any additional help um, paid. So if I can get other free that they're going to get something for it, that that would be great. So I, I had not really thought about looking there for people who need time that we can use them for free. So that's a good idea. Yeah, unfortunately, we were put on a uh, hiring freeze. So any internships that are looking for a job uh, at Mechanicsburg are more than welcome to not accept any pay. So, just like to throw that out there too. So. All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about um, some of the, I guess, non-traditional people that 
you might have help out in your school or district, let's focus on you know ways that teachers can help themselves. You know, what are some of the resources they can use, websites, um, etc. And Eric Kurtz, I think you're going to start us off. Sure thing. Um, we're all going to just share a couple quick ideas of things that, that we do, but uh, for, for what it's worth, um, this uh, might set the tone for, for this for us here. Uh, there's a, a web comic called XKCD at XKCD.com. If you're not familiar with it, I, I recommend it. I think, I think it's a hoot. It's very tech-oriented, tech and, and kind of math-oriented, math and science. Uh, but uh, there's a comic on there called the Tech Support Cheat Sheet. So if you haven't seen it, it's just xkcd.com uh, slash 627. That's, that's the actual link to this specific comic. But anyway, um, it's called the Tech Support Cheat Sheet. And uh, what, what you're going to see on here is uh, it says, Dear Various Parents, Grandparents, Coworkers, and Other Not Computer People, We Don't Magically Know How to Do Everything in Every Program. When We Help You, We're Usually Just Doing This. And below there is a flow chart. I won't read the whole thing to you. I mean, I would encourage you to go to the site and check it out. But it's basically saying, you know, you know, if you have a question, basically find a menu item or a button that looks somewhat related to what you want to do. If you can't find one, pick one at random. If you tried them all, Google the name of the program plus a few words that are related to it. Follow those instructions. Did that work? No. Have you been trying for half an hour? No. Try again. And finally, it's like, you know, if all else fails, then go ask somebody else for help. But And then at the bottom it says, please print this flow chart out, tape it to your screen, and congratulations, now you're the local computer expert. And that, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, minimize it. We all do work very hard at our jobs, but we don't know everything. You know, as tech folks, there's a lot of times when folks contact us with a question that, yeah, maybe because experience we have picked things up, but a lot of times that's exactly what we're doing. We're Googling it. <laughs> we're going in there and, and searching, uh, you know, through the forums or this or that, and we'll share some ideas here today about, about what, we, what we do, but that, that is the idea. So um, I will, of course, take the low-hanging fruit here and just mention Google. I mean, you know, it kind of goes without saying, but that is a really important thing to just go ahead and quickly throw out a search into Google if you're if you have a question about how to use a piece of software or your computer screen is acting funny or, or something like that. I'll give you a quick example. Um, we got some laptops recently. We're very fortunate, we're very nice. We were able to get some at a real low cost from, from some various sources. Um, and when those came in, one of the things that happened was uh, the teachers had a question about the volume. So we sent these laptops out. They were IBM R52s. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's one of the IBM ThinkPads. And the, they got out into the classroom and the teacher said, there's no sound. I, I, I can't hear anything. You know, we're trying to do stuff and there's no sound. Well, it turns out those laptops have a mute button, a volume up, and a volume down button specifically on the laptop. It's not like a hidden thing or something. Well, these are elementary kids. I mean, they could be touching that very, very easily. And so we started getting a lot of requests for saying, my my laptop's broken. My speakers are broken. The laptop doesn't work. Well, you know, if we had tried a Google approach saying something like IBM ThinkPad R52, how do I increase volume? You know, just a little Google search like that. Very quickly, you start getting hits that talk about things like that. And so, I mean, right away I found, you know, here's a ThinkPad forum. And not too far down into that, you know, they talk about different things, but they, you know, clearly in here, I'll scroll on down here and I'll probably miss where it's at. I was looking at, oh, there it is. It says the volume controls for the laptop um, are, they separate, they function separately from the volume control in Windows. And it says there's buttons and they're right next to the Think Vantage button. And all you got to do is push them. And that's exactly right. Now, let's say you want to encourage people to use Google more, um, there is a site you might want to try if they have a sense of humor. <laughs> it's called Let Me Google That For You. Uh, so let's say that I use another quick example. We got some Dell uh, D430 laptops through a grant as well. Again, very fortunate. We're very happy to be able to get those. Um, and they were, they, they were used, but uh, we're just still incredibly happy about it. Um, and what happened was, I set them all up and then sent them on over, and then when they got to the school, they said, we can't see the screen. It's too, it's too dim. Nobody can see it. Well, I set them up plugged in to power. I, did, I hadn't unplugged them and ran them on battery. Well, you guys know if you unplug the power, the screen dims because it's trying to conserve the battery. Well, they didn't realize that, and they were concerned that they had 
defective laptops because they couldn't see the screen well. Well, what you can do is you can Google something like Dell D430 adjust brightness or screen to dim or something like that, and it will tell you very quickly that, yes, there are keys with a little sun on them, and you hold down function, and you press up arrow or down arrow, and it increases or decreases the brightness. Well, what I could do, and I haven't been brave enough to, to do this yet, because, again, I don't want to offend anybody, but I, if, if it's, it's meant in a, in a good sense saying, here, let me show you, you can get those answers. Let me Google that for you is a website lmgtfy.com just take the first letters of each of those words let me google that for you go ahead and paste in what it is you're looking for so Dell D430 adjusting brightness and click Google search and what the site does is it creates a little video <laughs> and it gives you a link you can grab that link or you can get a bitly version of it and then you just take that link, copy, paste into an email, and send that link to somebody. When they click on the link, they get this video that I'm going to show right now that basically opens up. It shows the, uh, you know, clicking in the box, typing in your search term, clicking Google search, and then it says, was that so hard? <laughs> and then it pops you up to the actual result of that Google search, and there it is, third one down. Um, uh, adjusting brightness. I could click right on that link and it tells me right away that if your screen is too dim, use the function key and use the up arrow and the down arrow to increase or decrease the brightness. So anyway, my, my whole point of that is we're not geniuses. Really the best thing is learning how to search and taking advantage of that and not, and not being afraid to do so. But that's just one of our tools in our arsenal. Eric G, what would you share about a good tool? Well, I just I would just like to start off with saying I love that. That is the uh, sarcastic tech guy's uh, best friend there, as as long as everybody has a good sense of humor about that. Um, myself, I personally use YouTube a lot to find out how to do things. In fact, I got a demo unit of a Dell, oh, geez, it was one of their new ones. It was a 1012 or something crazy like that, and I had no idea how to get the hard drive out. I mean, it looked like it was embedded and then dipped in plastic. No idea how to get the hard drive out of it. And so I just Googled, or I'm sorry, I went to uh, YouTube and I said replace hard drive in Dell Netbook uh, D10 or something like that. And you got to be careful when you look, and this is actually Eric's, uh, Eric Kurtz's tip. Um, uh, this is actually Eric Kurtz's tip. When you're looking for something like that, you want to find the latest version of uh, whatever they're showing. Is that correct, Eric? That Sorry that about that. I just had a freeze. My screen was just frozen. <laughs> I, was I was trying to respond, and it was frozen up. Yeah, I I'm sorry, Eric. You're, you're right. We had discussed this earlier. And the thing about YouTube, the only caveat is nobody ever takes down a video. Once right. they put it up there, they leave it up there forever. So, I mean, I've done a search for how do you do page numbers in Google Documents. Well, if it's a video that got put up two years ago, that is totally different than how you do page numbers in a video that was put up six months, two months, whatever. So when you do run a search in YouTube, great idea. In that top corner, top right-hand corner, there's the option to sort by relevance or sort by date posted. You know, maybe you'll get the perfect hit with, with, with relevance, and that's fine. But look at the date anyway, and if you see that the top few results coming up are like three years old or four years old, maybe they're just really popular videos, may not hurt to go ahead and switch to sort by date uploaded to try to get some more recent videos. Go ahead, Eric. So yeah, they when I when I was you know uh, searching for this, you know, I, I had to pull the hard drive out, and I thought, um, you know, because I was talking to the tech, and he said, oh yeah, just pull the hard drive out, reseed it, and that should be fine. And I thought, you know, this is your demo unit, buddy. Why don't I just send it back to you, and you do this? And so he, you know, said, oh, you can find it on YouTube. So honest, honestly, I do this quick check and I'll be darned yeah it was there so there was uh, you know 10 videos of somebody you know how to pull out the hard drive so it really is up to you uh, you know to, to find the best link but I've also sent those links on to teachers and, and other things like that you know to my parents and uh, yeah this is how you add this or this is how you change the font in this program so um, for me you know something that I don't already have to create something that has been created for me is something I'm going to use you know, before I, that, that's my number one resource there. So, John? Yeah, there's two that I like, and the first one is called Video Jug, and I actually came across this when I was trying to find recipes for cooking chicken. So, uh, not only is it great for tech support, but also for dinner support, if that's something that you need to do. 
And much like YouTube, they have videos. Uh, the video that I pulled up just to share as an example is how to configure Outlook in 2003 and 2007. Um, and I can kind of speak to this because, you know, I do tech support here at Soita and, you know, we were using Outlook or a lot of people were using Outlook for a very long time. They weren't sure how to add their email accounts, uh, whether that was for work or personal or how to add their signature or, you know, if you wanted to set up uh, rules or anything like that. So, you know, I just searched for that in video jug and there's several videos, you know, and this is one in particular, you know, how to configure Outlook 2003 and, and 2007. So, um, you know, a, another one similar to YouTube, um, just with, I guess, a, you know, some, some different videos. Another great resource is this Cura website. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And this is different than YouTube and, and Video Jug. Here you can actually follow other people's questions. So in this case, the question is, is it possible to install Chrome OS in a notebook? You know, so I'm assuming that they mean, you know, can I install it on other things besides a Chromebook? And then you can see people's responses. And you can subscribe to that just like an RSS feed, just like uh, Eric Kurtz was talking about earlier. And you can post your own questions. So if I go back to my homepage here, um, and you do need to sign up for an account to do this, I can click ask a question. And, you know, my, I might ask something about, you know, what's an extension I can use to capture a screen in Chrome? and then other people can respond to it. So you can not only look at what others have said, but also ask your own questions, and, and you get some fairly quick responses. And if you'd like that with you on the go, there is an iOS app for that. It's not available yet for the iPad, but you can certainly put it on your iPhone or on your iPod Touch uh, to keep up on responses to your own questions. Well, excellent. And uh, just in case, to make sure people heard that, uh, the first one was Video Jug, so J U G dot com, I believe. And the next one, I'm not sure how to say it either, Sean. Cora, or so it's Q U O R A. Am I, am I spelling that right? Cora yep. dot com? Cora. It's okay. Cora. Cora. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay, how, how about the rest of you guys, Brian and TJ? Uh, something that uh, you would mention about uh, the, you know, about. Get, you know, getting tech help for yourself or providing it through uh, a non-human method. Well, I, I agree with uh, Google being a great resource, but I, I think 90% of the time our staff doesn't want to look up the answers for themselves. Um, and, and I'm not going to say that's true with everybody. I've got a lot of staff members who now that I made our own site, I can track who's going to the site and stuff. We have um, our own self-help site that is um, called edtechteach.com and that's where I put the common an questions and answers that they've got and I, I usually use them as um, screen capture videos so when we were doing our training on how to do your e-day lessons for the teachers um, that all the material that they needed was right here and it's all usually in videos. Some of it's not uh, video lessons, but the idea there is that they can find that stuff without having to Google and figure out which one's the right one. And a lot of times on these, like um, the online tools for teachers one, I've already gone and found the stuff for them and then um, linked it here so they don't have to Google it. They can just go and look, oh, I want to know about online learning stuff, or here's a bunch of links to research tools or lesson plan tools. I've gone ahead and collaborated all that for them so that um, they can at least know one place to get started. And then if I don't have the answer, there's a, a forum up top that they can ask questions on, and I'll usually add a video or add a link and then tell them where that's at. So it, it's kind of an in-between of I try to find the answers for them and put it on our site so they don't have to go to Google. I, I mean, I'm sure I have tons of teachers that are willing to do that, but I have probably an equal number of teachers that uh, if I don't have it here, they're not going to look anywhere else. So that's another way to kind of do that too. Brian, I'll go ahead and piggyback real quick on that and then, and then pass over to TJ for whatever he can add to it. Um, but you're right. Um, we've tried to do the same thing on our tech website, um, putting together um, help printable guides, help FAQs, help videos. And what I have found to be, I, I think the best way to do this is whenever somebody will ask me a question, it's again, it's that, you know, spending the time up front. But when they ask me a question, I think, well, 
if I don't have an FAQ for that, I really should make one for that. Take the extra time, take a few more minutes, and go ahead and write up that FAQ, because if they're asking me, somebody else probably is wondering the same thing too. And so we have an FAQ section that covers, you know, you know, viruses and Dazzle and Gmail and email and Google Calendar and Google Docs and our IEP program and Pinnacle, our grading system and, and whatever. And so if somebody has a question, I try to have all of these, you know, FAQs set up that have a simple question and an answer to what it is uh, they may be wondering about. So then when I respond to that email, I don't just give the answer in the email. All I say is, um, hey, check out the FAQ on our tech website, and I give a link and send it to them. So they get the answer, but they also go, oh, I didn't even know we had that, because they may not realize that, and that helps them see, oh, wow. So I've served a few purposes. I've created an FAQ now for a question that hopefully I don't have to ever recreate again and now I've helped that teacher see that they again can help themselves by coming to our website to find that so yeah that is a it takes a lot of time and it takes you know um, years to build those things up um, and long time too to get people to go to them and use them but I think it's a very valuable resource TJ I guess I want to first start off by giving a standing ovation, um, just because that site is just that amazing. Um, and again, with the reinventing the wheel, a lot of times I just send people to that website because you have done the work. Um, but along the line, something that was started um, before I uh, came to Huron um, was the wiki style. Um, so let me share this real quick. Oops, wrong one. So this is something that started by my predecessor, Gary Larizza. Um, and it's really easy just to have a wiki, just because you can jump in here and edit it super quick. So this is the documentation as far as the network. Um, but there's also, if you come up here, there's a couple, you know, how-tos, and we have an extended library on our actual website. Um, and again, we do the Google Docs thing where, you know, I'll share out a tutorial, um, use QuickTime to record a video real quick, a lot of the same things you guys are doing. Um, but when I left Firelands, they really utilized the one that I built, the wiki that I had built. And it's so easy from a technician point of view, because if you have a student tech, you can say, hey, it's on the wiki, um, look under product keys, or you know, look under the computer lab, or here's what the printers are. You know, it's all right there for them. So instead of just having a Word doc that lives on your you know, desktop, put it out there on the web so that way they can see it. And the great thing about um, with the wiki if I remember, make sure I do this, but it is password protected, so you can password protect some things. So I have no problem putting product keys up there because it does require a password. Um, an extension from that is as part of our help desk, we do have an FAQ, um, and this is something I'm working more and more in getting them in here, and it'll pop up the FAQ um, whenever they submit a request. So let's say they say, my category is technology slash Google problem, everything that I've listed as a Google FAQ will then pop up and answer their question. So before it gets to um, my desk, they get an FAQ that might be able to help them out. Um, and another thing that I can't recommend enough, and I'm kind of cautious of putting this up there, um, but is Twitter. Uh, just because it's easy you know, to ask a question and uh, maybe not as technical, um, but it's something that the teachers can start building their network and ask, hey, how do you do this? You know, how are you guys dealing with this? And, you know, those social media things can really help them and get them the instant feedback that they need. No, yeah, you're exactly right, TJ. That, that, is, that is true. And I had a quick question when you showed your, your help desk. Is that web help desk? It is indeed. That is, that is the same help desk we use as well. Earlier when we talked about help desks, I, I didn't throw that out there, but that is a commercial product it does it does cost money but it's not much it's 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 free for one person but okay that's right but we've got a few more texts so we do pay for the extra text but wow what a great thing to have a system like that you're right where you can track all of the tickets and share them with people and it also will do FAQs for you and I'm sure that uh, web help desk isn't listening right now um, but when I was at Firelands we did have just one user um, because when I got there there was no help desk so if you don't have a help desk like there's a bunch of free ones out there, and it just makes your life easier, and it gives you that accountability of if you go from 150 to 700 computers, 
and you're like, I need somebody, this is a way for you to document that you need that extra help. Look how many help desk requests. Look at the customer serv disservice that we're doing. Um, from coming from retail and Geek Squad, I get, you know, customer service is my biggest thing. Um, and this provides your superintendent. We're spending more time, you know, this, the teacher's computers are broken, so they're not getting back to the learning as quickly as they should, you know, and the help desk helps you document that. So if you don't have a help desk, get out there, get one. Well, and, and, and it is not an expensive product. Don't get me wrong at all. We have no money, so you know it's not expensive. It's not it's worth and, every and, single thing. And what's nice money. about it is that when people need to submit a ticket, they do not have to go to a website to do it. They simply send an email to a help address that we have set up, and that's it. If they can send an email, they can submit a ticket, and that's it. It puts it in the system, and it gets going. Um, well, let me go ahead and throw out one last thing, and I think we're probably going to be wrapping up here time-wise. I did want to mention atomic learning for two reasons. One is that that was one of the other feedback pieces we got from the Ohio uh, or the surrounding area tech coordinators. Uh, Matt Simpson uh, from Pomeroy also mentioned that he uses atomic learning for his teachers as a way to give them uh, tech support so they can take classes through atomic learning which is basically lots of small videos and then when they've taken so many classes he gives them some sort of incentive um, and you know, it depends on what it is sometimes they've gotten free computers to take home you know for, for their home uh, different things like that just depends uh, this, so that's a great thing but the second reason I wanted to mention it is don't forget if you're in Ohio you can get atomic learning for free still if you complete that application that's on eTech's website. There's only like a few more days left, I think, and then that's no longer going to be available. So make sure you take advantage of that if you've not done that already. Um, but uh, anyway, that's uh, that was that. Uh, any final words on tech support? I wanted to share something um, too real quick, and it's kind of to piggyback on that Spiceworks thing. Um, you have a really cool dashboard, and it shows like the gauges and things. Um, Ryan Collins does something similar um, at Kenton. He actually has a TV or a small like screen outside of his um, work area, and it actually shows um, you know how many tickets are open, you know what texts are in the building. It gives those users you know that information. Um, and I'm sure if I if I find it, I'll talk to him and put it in the stone in the show notes. Um, but and then he has a website that has how many tickets are open. If there's any downtimes, he can send out alert messages like, hey, you know, we're having an issue with this, or you know, and he can send that out. And it's a great, um, just a great way to inform your users of what's going on. Um, and the last point that I want to have, then I'll shut up, is building pride. If your students have pride in what they're doing, and this is something again I learned at Geek Squad. Um, my whole room was done in Geek Squad when I worked there. I was very passion, you know, passion driven because I was part of something. So if you put that, you know, group of student techs up on a higher level, like have them build that pride, you guys are the chosen ones. I feel like like a Star Wars thing here, but you know, you guys are the chosen ones and build that pride, you'll build that passion and now you'll see better results. So passion driven learning is something that is very, very important. And I will not shut up. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're almost out of time uh, before the Hangout explodes, so I want to thank TJ and Brian for, for participating in our podcast again. Just to let you know about some of our upcoming shows, on December 6th, we're going to be podcasting from the Soda Conference, barring a blizzard, and we're going to be talking with uh, Leslie Fisher about our favorite gadgets. Um, on the 17th, we're going to be talking about technology and mathematics, best practices. On December 31st, uh, we're going to be doing our tech predictions, our tech wishes, hopes, and dreams for the new year. So uh, I'm hoping for the iPhone 7. All right, uh, Eric G, do you want to let everybody know how they get in touch with us? I do. Uh, actually, Eric, did we have any listener feedback from last time? Um, no, I did not have anything to add on listener feedback other than what we got through the survey, which was excellent. And I, again, want to thank those people very much for taking the time to fill out our survey. Look for the surveys on the upcoming shows as well on our website, which, Eric G., you can share all about. Absolutely. Thank you for popping that up there for me. Uh, our website, of course, is thestateoftech.org. 
and uh, we want to thank you for watching or listening. Uh, there are several different ways to contact us. Uh, one is by phone. It's 513-318-TECH, and that's a Google Voice number. You can also contact us by, uh, via Twitter, at the state of Tech. Uh, email us. Uh, it's a Gmail account. It's thestateoftech at gmail.com. And don't forget to you know, leave comments, post comments in our show notes, rate us in iTunes. Uh, anything you, do, you can do to positively promote the state of tech, we would greatly appreciate it. And um, anything else? All right. All right. This has been a state of tech, and we will see you in another two weeks for another state of tech.